Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 2020 Improving Data, Improving Outcomes virtual convening. Um, hope you can hear me. And over the next four days, we've designed what we hope will be interesting and engaging sessions. And we're sponsored, this is a welcome from the Center for IDEA Early Childhood Data Systems. And I am Donna Spiker, and I'm here with my co-director, Kathy Hebler, who will say hello. Kathy? Hi, everyone. Oh. <laughs> I just want to join Donna in welcoming you to our virtual convening. We are really excited to get to spend the next couple of days with you. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing our familiar faces and meeting some, some new people too. Um, so welcome and we hope you have a great conference. And I also, as you'll see here, want to uh, welcome from um, Grace Kelly and Cornelia Taylor who are our DAISY Center Deputy Directors. And next I want to send a welcome from our other Early Childhood Technical Assistance Centers. And you're going to be hearing from some of them in sessions over the next four days. And here you can see the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center co-directors, Christina Kaprzak and Megan Vinn. And next, a welcome from our Early Childhood Personnel Center. And here you see Director Mary Beth Bruder and Assistant Director Darla Gundler. And finally, next, from the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations, you see here Lisa Fox, Principal Investigator and co-principal investigators, um, Mary Louise Hameter, known as ML, Phil Strain and Barbara Smith. And finally, on our next slide, a big welcome to all of you. And there's all 305 of you, maybe some more registered yesterday. We've got 48 Part C coordinators, 43 Part C data managers, 4619 coordinators, 31 Part B data managers, we have 22 parent leaders, 33 other state staff who work in our early childhood programs, 14 staff from OSEP, whom you'll be hearing from some of them later, and 74 TA providers. So first I just have a few little housekeeping things for you to know before we get started. So we have resources in your event platform including information about the TA centers I mentioned and a PDF of the full detailed agenda. And also there is a sheet with acronyms. Our, well, unfortunately our early childhood field, field is loaded with acronyms and this sheet will help us all know what we're all talking about. And then as, as we're a data center, we're gonna collect data at the end. We're going to ask you for feedback about our sessions. There'll be some links in the event platform after at the end of each session for you to give us some feedback. And then after the convening ends on Thursday, you'll get an evaluation survey. Also in our closing plenary, OSEP will be answering questions. We have a whole block um, set aside for that. And we, you had an opportunity to submit questions during registration, but also during the convening, um, we will, um, there'll be a place in the platform for you to submit questions during the week. And then finally, for those of you who use social media, our hashtag DAISYIDIO2020 to um, post throughout the convening. So let's get to our theme. So the theme of our conference this year is data leadership in the time of COVID. And here you see the two um, overarching objectives of our convening this year. And what we're hoping is that participants will increase their knowledge and skills related to these two things. 
but first the collection analysis and use of data to support children and families. And second, building organizational capacity to support the implementation of evidence-based practices. And this is especially including during this, um, during this period of all these disruptions because of COVID-19. And over the next four days, you, we hope you learn something new and meet someone new. So in keeping with the fact that we're all early childhood people, our convening is brought to you by the letters L, E, and D, and all the numbers for data. These three letters, uh, leadership, equity, and data, and all the numbers for the data theme. And COVID, we think, has made these three words especially relevant, both in the world at large and in the work that we do. And over the next four days, you're going to hear about and discuss the meaning and importance of these three words for our work and how they're interrelated. And you're going to be hearing about that in our plenary sessions and in our concurrent and role-alike sessions later today and on Tuesday and Wednesday. So next, so leadership. Well, you all are leaders. And I've been reading a book here called How to Lead, and it contains interviews with individuals who are considered to have strong leadership skills. And they're from government, tech, finance, entertainment, sports, a variety of fields. And what I've, de I've, I've kind of come away with a few takeaways that I summarized here. And first is, is about, well, what does it take to be a good leader? And here are some of the nuggets that I've pulled from this book. One is that you have a focus. Two is that you communicate well. Thirdly, that you know what your priorities are and sort of the next three is you're in action. You rise to the occasion, and COVID-19 has certainly forced leaders to rise to the occasion. But you also have humility that you don't know all the answers, and you're going to have failure, and you deal with failure by being persistent. And part of the reason I think you're all here today is that you have the ability to keep learning, and you're always wanting to learn more. And then a big takeaway across all of these interviews that I've seen is that effective leaders get other people to follow them because they have a vision. And that vision, it's useful to them, but it's useful to others and it's good for all of us. And so our other two themes, apropos of the concept of a vision, are other two words, equity and data. And what you see here are some reports from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. And these are all books about uh, equity and data. And they summarize um, the way data and equity are important in early childhood and in building healthy children, families, and communities. And what I believe, one of the, that I've gleaned from looking at these and thinking about it is that our work is about a shared vision of equity. And this is about equity in access, participation, and opportunity for our children and our families. And secondly, to promote that vision, we are committed to collecting and using high quality accurate data. And data will help us ultimately understand and make good decisions about equity, data about access, about participation, and about opportunity. And again, you're going to be hearing about and discussing these issues over the next four days. And so now let's get started with our presentations. And I'd like to introduce Meredith Michelli, who is our DAISY Center Project Officer. Hello. And we'll bring up Mary I'm, there. <laughs> Hello. I'm Meredith Michelli with, from the Research to Practice Division in OSEP. And I, as Donna said, I am one of the project officers for DAISY. Amy Bay, also with the Research to Practice Division in OSEP, is my co-project officer. On behalf of Amy and myself, we would like to welcome you to this conference. 
I've had the pleasure of working with Daisy and Kathy and Donna since 2012 when Daisy was first funded. And we are excited to see the work that the second round of this center will generate. We have come a long way since then from a focus on improving early childhood data systems as defined by individual elements and capabilities to a focus on how to use those early childhood data systems to answer critical policy questions and improve programs for infants, toddlers, and young children with disabilities and their families. There continues to be a focus on linking data across Part C and 619 and Part B, as well as across early childhood programs, but a more defined message that linking should be done for a purpose and be based on use cases. Data can be so powerful when you have confidence in the quality of the data you're using, when you help others to understand the message those data are conveying. I look forward to seeing how you all are working towards using high quality data as an asset for improving Part C and 619 programs and those outcomes of infants and toddlers and young children with disabilities and their families. I wanna thank Daisy and their partners for putting together this wonderful agenda. And I'd also like to thank you all for participating in the conference. I look forward to engaging in the sessions and hearing from uh, about your successes, challenges, and needs in the areas of early childhood data, early childhood program improvement. Now it is my honor to introduce my division director, Dr. Larry Wexler. Doc Dr. Wexler's leadership is responsible for the funding of DAISY as well as those other OSEP funded TA centers. He has been a strong advocate for ensuring states have access to high quality technical assistance to improve the quality and efficiency of reporting data on infants, toddlers, and young children with disabilities. His commitment to the data work is also evident in his investment in the management publication <coughs> of IDA data within OSEP as he pushes to have easy to understand presentations of the data so that it can be used to ask questions, start conversations, and drive change. As I noted before, Dr. Wexler is the Director of the Research to Practice Division in OSEP. He's been in the field of special education for 45 years, having been a teacher of students with severe disabilities, program director, principal, state intellectual disabilities specialist, chief of staff to a director of special education, director of state um, monitoring, OSEP state contact, OSEP project officer, de deputy director, and OSEP, and then associate division director responsible for OSEP's national initiatives team. Um, he holds a bachelor's degree in international relations from American University and a master's degree um, from Howard University. And his doctorate was in the concentration in severe disabilities from Johns Hopkins. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Larry Wexler. Uh, thank you, Meredith. <laughs> and a partridge in a pear tree. Yes. Uh, uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to just take a couple of minutes and, and, and chat with you all. Um, I, I wanted to first recognize the two project officers, uh, uh, Meredith Michelli and Amy Bay. You know, um, uh, I, I have a saying in, in my division that uh, I can make anyone into a... Uh, uh, a grants manager, uh, but I can't make them into a grants grower. Uh, we, we take a uh, great deal of pride in uh, uh, having content specialists serve as project officers. And, uh, uh, you know, our, our project officers aren't just grants managers, but they're also critical thought partners uh, in the development and the growing of the grants. And uh, I just want to uh, thank Meredith and, and Amy because, frankly, they do a terrific job. So um, uh, thank you. Um, just a couple of things. Um, I, I wanted to say something about the um, conceptualization of DAISY. Um, uh, Meredith mentioned it's in its second iteration. Um, you know, when we made the original investment, it represented a commitment to uh, early childhood data. Uh, but I, I want it very clear that it's not just the data that we were committed to. Um, uh, way back when, and I know that uh, Kathy and Donna have uh, um, memories of this, um, when we conceptualized uh, uh, DAISY, 
we conceptualized that the Early Childhood Outcome Center would be integrated into DAISY. Uh, there was some overlapping funding, but I believe in its third year, uh, the Early Childhood Outcome Center was in fact, uh, the funds went into DAISY. Uh, and that was done with thought and purpose. Uh, uh, the thought and purpose being that, um, this is about kid outcomes. It's not just about collecting the data. And that uh, it's not a question of just supporting states to collect uh, quality data. Uh, more importantly, it's to use the data, to use the data to drive policy and outcomes. So that, that to me is the whole purpose of, of DAISY that yes, of course, the data have to meet the statutory requirements and we have to make sure that it's, if it's not valid, uh, there's no point in collecting it. So, you know, Daisy does a, a great job with that. And my data team does an incredible job with the validity of the data and the quality control of the data. But the goal here is not to say we collected the data. The goal here is to provide states with, um, with the means to make good decisions about policy and driving what happens to kids with disabilities. So in, in that vein, we had been uh, kind of toying around with the ideas of how can we put a different public facing on our data so that it would be useful. And um, uh, I, I originally characterized it as data snooping, and I was like roundly criticized that that was not the word that we wanted to use. It had all sorts of horrible implications. Uh, uh, so I changed it to data mining. Uh, and I gave our data team, uh, and, and David Egner is the associate division director in which the data team is embedded. I gave them the task of, please, you know, come up with something, you know, and, and that's the, uh, that, that, that's the advantage of being in my position. I can say come up with something without having a great idea of what the something is. But like I said, I have incredibly uh, uh, creative and just smart people working for us. And lo and behold, uh, I don't know the exact date, but it was probably eight months ago. Um, the team came up with the fast facts concept. So uh, if you could turn that slide to, there we go, um, to the fast facts. Now, hopefully you've seen fast facts. There'll, there'll be um, uh, uh, links embedded. But, you know, the purpose of the fast facts, and they're on various, we started with autism. Um, we have a part C1, we have a personnel one. Uh, we, we, we have one that focuses on uh, African-Americans. Um, the purpose is very simple. It's to generate questions and discussion within states and districts. That's the purpose. It's all public data. It's just represented in a friendly manner and a lot of anomalies are in those data and are fairly clear if someone looks for them. And so the fast facts is, is exactly that. They're quick facts, they represent public data, and the idea is you could hand those facts to a, uh, a state superintendent, you could hand them to a parent, you could hand them to a teacher, and they're go it's going to generate discussion. So I, I have to say, I have nothing but praise for the team that pulled the fast facts together. And you know, there's nothing worse than success because it means uh, higher demands are put on the team. So they'll be generating additional fast facts. And if you have any ideas of what you'd like them to be, you know, please contact Meredith Michelli and Amy Bay. Um, uh, so, anyway, that's where the, I'm bringing something up on my own screen, sorry. Uh, 
Oh, and by the way, uh, the picture of me on that first slide, uh, I think that was taken eight months ago, and that was the last time I wore a tie. So, you know, I'm in my lower level of my house, and uh, it's a different life, certainly, from uh, what I had been leading the last 45 or 50 years, actually. So um, uh, I apologize if I'm too informal. So now it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce David Cantrell, who will be our next speaker. And uh, David, uh, Dr. Cantrell uh, is a member of the Senior Executive uh, Service and serves as the Deputy Director of OSEP within OSERS. Uh, he's responsible for overseeing the administration of the IDEA, which uh, authorizes formula grants to states as well as discretionary grants. Uh, prior to joining OSEP, David uh, worked as a director in the department's Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, where he administered grants to states and local education agencies for the Rural, rural uh, Education Achievement Program and Consolidated Grant to the insular areas. He also spearheaded TA activities for states by leading the Office of Program and Grantee Support Services, um, which oversees the equity assistance centers and the comm centers. David has 30 years of professional experience. He's a team-oriented leader with an extensive background serving children with disabilities and their families. He began his career as a special ed educator in Raleigh, North Carolina, and then joined the U.S. Department of Defense uh, um, education activity, that's we call it DODIA, where he taught students with various disabilities in grades preschool to high school. After teaching, he moved into administration, serving as a district coordinator, uh, school administrator, and finally as director of special ed and student services for DODIA. Uh, throughout his career, David has passionately advocated on behalf of students with disabilities. His areas of interest include homeschool partnerships, early intervention services for infants and toddlers with disabilities, and dropout prevention programs for students with disabilities. David was born in Dayton, Ohio, and raised in Louisville, Kentucky holds a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish from the University of Louisville, a Master's of Education in Special Ed from North Carolina State, and a Doctor of Philosophy in Special Education Policy from the University of Maryland at College Park. David is an avid traveler. He lives in, although he's not traveling these days, he, he lives in uh, Washington, D.C., where he spends his free time reading, gardening, and running. So it is my pleasure to introduce David Cantrell, Dr. David Cantrell, the Deputy Director of OSEP. David. Thank you, Larry. Dr. Wexler, I really appreciate that introduction. And good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me in this presentation. This is certainly a unique time that we all find ourselves in. Um, as Larry said, I'm certainly not traveling these days. I'm trying to stay safe and healthy and well, as all of you are, I'm sure. Um, first, I wanna say thank you to ECTA, ECPC, DAISY, and the National um, Center Pyramid for Pyramid Model. We very much value the importance of, of data and it's, a, it's um, a very important for us to be here this week with you. And on behalf of our director, Lori Vanderplug, um, I'm excited to go over in the next few minutes some of our initiatives and also some exciting grants that we wrote out this year that focus particularly on preschool children. So as Larry said, um, I am a special educator by trade. Uh, for six years, I served as a preschool teacher for young children with disabilities, and I worked extensively with the um, early intervention services um, throughout many of the states and on the DOD schools overseas. Um, I learned firsthand the importance of early intervention, um, early uh, identification, working closely with parents, and how through early intervention and developing positive collaborative relationships with not only the early intervention specialists, but also with parents, what, how this tremendously affects the students and their progress. 
Um, I, I could spend my whole time actually talking about some wonderful experiences I had working with preschool children with disabilities, but I think each of us who are passionate about education and particularly the preschool population have our own examples of um, success stories, if you will. So with that, um, next slide, let me talk a little bit about our vision and how we see ourselves helping, helping you in your role as state Part C coordinators and 619 preschool data, data coordinators. In OSEP, we, we see our role as pivotal and instrumental in providing you, as Larry said, with the necessary data to inform your local decisions. Um, we also um, want to embrace and do embrace collaborative activities, not only within the department, but also with other agencies such as HHS. And of course, we value the input we receive from you. Um, um, the, um, over the past few months in this unique situation, we've held many listening sessions with many of you, with many of the state directors of special education, and also national organizations. This has helped us keep a pulse on what are the needs of our stakeholders, what are the needs of educational leaders, of, of the teachers it, who are in the trenches working with students, either in some type of a hybrid model, face-to-face, -face, or 100% virtual setting. Um, additionally, I, I want to mention that within our office, we very much value the perspective of continuous improvement. We have excellent staff, and um, as Larry said, we have um, spent a lot of time talking about what, what are we hearing from the field? What are the needs of our stakeholders in terms of data? How can we present data differently? How can um, it be modified based on what your needs are? So as, as you um, participate in this week's event, please continue to let us know how we can provide data differently to you. And I also understand, understand that you can add, offer some questions this week. And on Wednesday, Thursday, Lori Vanderplug, our director, and I will answer those questions. So please let us know how we can further um, our assistance to you regarding data. Next slide, please. So it, it's hard to believe we're towards the end of October, gearing up for a new fiscal year, FY21. But I, I do want to spend some time talking about um, our efforts in this, this past year. So we, we met our timeline, we awarded $13 billion for our Part, Part B grants, $394,000 for 619 preschool grants, but then we also had four hundred seventy dollars in Part C for our um, early childhood birth to three grants. So just as something to put on your radar, for FY21, the grant applications for Part B will be due the third week of May, and Part C, the first week of May. And this is typ typical of our year-to-year -year cadence of the, for the grant applications. Another point I want to mention, uh, if some of you have looked at the Federal Register, we have put out a Part, Part C IDA data information collection. This is required revision uh, with the three-year cycle. There are actually no changes to the data collection, but I wanted to make you aware of that if you would like to go and make some comments. Those comments are due by November 4th. Next slide, please. So this, this week's conference is talking about the importance of data. And in, in OSEP, we very much value the use of high quality data. And we, and we believe that it is an important piece in the implementation of effective Part C and 619 or preschool programs. It's also important to engage your stakeholders locally, whether they're parents, educators, or community members. And I also want to thank those parents who are participating in this week's event. I was particularly pleased to see that there, was, there were over 50 parent leaders that are, they're in, that are participating this week. And I think that is so powerful to have you at the table with us when we're talking about not only the data that is available, but how the data can be used. Additionally, it's important to present the data in formats that are easily um, understood and easily accessible, always remembering 508 compliance, and also do, is it necessary to provide the data in multiple languages. Here in OSEP, we ourselves use the, the, da uh, the data that is presented. We have internal conversations about the data for either specific subgroups, for example, African-Americans, 
or um, other topics that we find it's very important to utilize the data ourselves to inform our decisions, whether it's a particular grant that we want to roll out, or if it's an initiative that we know needs to be modified, or if it's a technical assistance resource that we want to work with our grantees to develop based on what the data are telling us. Additionally, we use the data to inform our differenti differentiated systems of monitoring 2.0 process that has just been rolled out. The data is critical to identify um, how states are doing in terms of implementing effective systems for infants, toddlers, children, and youth with disabilities. And lastly, I, I don't think this is any surprise, but we certainly engage in conversations with other agencies such as HHS, and we use these data to drive those conversations. Next slide, please. So this is the um, OSEP Fast Facts that actually began, I believe, in March of this year. And I know as a former educator um, and a lifelong learner, of course, I, I think the, the presentation of this data is just tremendous. The ability to click on each individual state, to pull up the different sets, um, sites of data, and um, it's just so user friendly. So kudos to our team. Um, Meredith um, Michelli and Amy Bay for leading this initiative. Um, we're, we're hoping that you're using these, these data resources as they provide um, counts, gender, um, and location information as well. Next slide, please. So this is the newest Fast Facts Center um, data that was, I, I believe, released just last week. Um, and this focuses on our preschool um, population or uh, section 619. It provides, of course, information regarding um, student, um, student count, gender, location, and disability type. You know, again, when you click on these different um, states, it's very interactive, it's user friendly, it's 508 compliance. Um, we really do hope you're using this data. And again, if you um, are reviewing this data and you have some suggestions either for the presentation of the data um, or um, modifying how it, how it is presented, please let us know. We, we certainly want to present this data in an easy, accessible format so that it is used by you, our stakeholders. Next slide, please. So now I wanna shift my conversation a little bit to um, what I really feel are our successes for FY20. Um, under Dr. Wexler's, Wexler's leadership, our discretionary grant program has focused um, six new awards on the preschool population. This is really exciting for us, and we, we're very much looking forward to the outcomes of the activities of these six grants in terms of improving the outcomes of young children with disabilities. So the, the, the first two I'll be speaking of are the, um, the first one is the 373F, um, you don't have to worry about the numbering, but it's the IDA Fiscal Data Center. The, the objective of this center is to improve the capacity of state leaders such as yourselves in terms of meeting the, the fiscal data re reporting requirements every year. This grant was awarded to WestEd and um, they're focusing on maintenance of state financial effort, local education, LEA maintenance, so MFS, MOE, um, and also um, allocation of IDA Part D subgrants. Um, so we're really excited about um, the rollout of this new fiscal data center, but then if, next slide, please. The second center is the a IDA data management center. Now, um, I think this one is really, really exciting. The, the objective of this center is to um, integrate special education data with longitudinal data that's, that you that at the state level are collecting for all students. This center was, a, uh, this grant was awarded to the Applied Engineering Management Corporation or AEM and their charge is to develop, to develop technical assistance resources for you so that you can build your internal capacity for reporting the annual um, data collection requirements um, also assisting you coordinating and improving your capacity at the state level, as well as rolling out um, an SEA cohort among states. Um, so please, as you are accessing the services from these grantees, please let us know how, um, this, how you are receiving 
the su supports? Is there anything we can do to clarify the services that they are providing? And we're always interested in possible tweaks to the service delivery. Next slide, please. So as many of you know, nationally across the country, there is a shortage in um, not only special education personnel from birth to three, preschool students, even secondary, uh, middle school and secondary students, but there is also a shortage in um, qualified and certified personnel for the early intervention population. So we are um, just something I want you, want you to be aware of. Mark your calendars for no, October 27th, 8th, and 29th, so next week. We will be having our Attract, Prepare, and Retain Summit. Of course, it will be virtual. And um, we will be focusing on what are some effective strategies to attract, retain educators in um, various disciplines um, that we know are in need across the country. So that will be next week. So along those same lines, we, we saw the need to not only identify special educators and early intervention specialists for preschool preschool for the preschool population, excuse me, but we, we went forward with, with three specific grants. And this is the first one, our personal development program. So this was, when is, was designed to prepare special education, early intervention, and related services personnel that work with high with students with high intensity needs. Uh, we actually awarded six early childhood grants, um, around uh, 350,000. Uh, those went live last beginning of this month and we're really excited about the the work that this that these grants will do in terms of identifying special educators to work with our students with high intensity needs next slide please the this the second slide um, grant that we issued this year uh, we actually issued four new early childhood grants for leadership development for again, the early childhood population. The charge of, this, of these grants were to recruit and retain at the, at the SEA regional and local levels, leaders in special education, particularly for early childhood. I think this is a tremendous effort and we're really excited to see the outcomes of these grants. And the next slide, please. So this is the last grant that we awarded. Again, that focuses on identification, retention, of special education and related services personnel. This one focuses on improving the retention of special education teachers and the early intervention population of, of, of personnel as well. This one was awarded, um, we awarded two new early childhood focus grants. Um, one was to Connecticut Office of Early Childhood and the second was to the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. Both of these are designed to build on existing professional development activities um, to enrich the framework for individualized um, educational opportunities to promote skill and career advancement um, for, to provide a stable, talented community of early intervention professionals, excuse me. So both of these um, grants are, again, designed to recruit, retain early intervention personnel that, that we know um, are so desperately needed across the country at this time. Next slide, please. So lastly, the, the sixth grant that we awarded this year, focusing on early childhood, um, are the model demonstration projects to improve coaching systems. Um, as um, educators, I think we all know the value of coaching and how coaching in the school level can be a tremendous tool to, to um, improve the skills of our educators, but also for our leadership as well. So three, er, three new early childhood focus grants were awarded. The first went to the University of Nebraska, the second University of Washington, and lastly to the University of Florida. So e each of these universities will be charged with identifying coaching systems and implementing them at the local level to, de to determine the effectiveness of these coaching systems. So hopefully the long-term that we can replicate these throughout the states and uh, to include our insular areas as well. So of these six initiatives or six grants this year, we're focusing on building the capacity of our, not only the leadership, but also our early ch childhood professionals, our early childhood 
intervention specialists as well, um, focusing on reliability of data to inform those decisions. And of course, ultimately, our goal is to improve the outcomes of children with disabilities. Next slide, please. So this slide and the following slide really focus on the resources that we have available to you at the state level and as well as the parents who are participating in this, in this conference. So our, our IDA, um, Ideas That Work website, I hope this is not a surprise, um, has several sections, but the first section I want to highlight are our Part C resources. These focus, of course, on resources and interventions for the birth to three population, students who will eventually transfer with an IFSP to the Part B program with an IEP. Next slide, please. So these resources focus solely on the 619 or preschool population. The site, both of these sites are continuously updated and particularly in light of the pandemic, our staff have worked um, over the last months to update and work with our technical assistance centers to provide appropriate resources um, for educators, leaders, and parents in terms of the fluid, situ the, the, the fluid situation we have right now with educating our students with disabilities across the country. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I'm really excited for this week's events. Uh, these presentations are uh, very appropriate at this time, and um, I look forward to speaking with you on uh, Thursday when Lori Vanderplug and I will answer some of your questions. And lastly, let me say that um, thank you very much for your dedication, for your support of our youth and children with disabilities. Um, it takes all of us working together to inform and improve the outcomes of all of our students with disabilities. So thank you again, and I um, and please enjoy the conference. Thank you. And hello again, and thanks to Larry and David. And now I am very excited to introduce our first opening keynote speaker, Steve Tozer. Dr. Tozer is Professor Emeritus and past university scholar in the education policy studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And there he was the founding director of the Center for Urban Education Leadership. And I was pretty pleased to see that he started out, he was a graduate of the Erickson Institute for Early Childhood Education in Chicago. And he started his career at Hull House as a kindergarten teacher. And then he directed an early childhood center in Uptown Chicago. Steve chaired the Department of Curriculum Instruction at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and the Department of Education Policy Studies at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He was also on the Governor's Council for Education Quality, and he ran an a legislative task force to develop a state um, certificate for principals. And he's lead author of several books and editor of several education leadership books, including the one you see here on the screen. And Steve is also currently a senior fellow at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and Learning, Teaching, and the Learning Policy Institute, which are both down the road from me here in California. His work focuses on education leadership, organizational development, equity and justice, and continuous improvement and improvement science. Throughout his career, I learned that Steve's teaching and research has been grounded in an effort to question and disrupt school policies and practices that systematically advantage some population groups and disadvantage others. So he certainly knows a lot about our three key words, leadership, equity, and data. And I also learned he has four grandchildren, ages four months to eight years, so he also knows a lot about our little ones. So welcome Steve, who's gonna talk with us about information and inquiry in leadership for equity, why data systems matter. Thank you very much, Donna. And thanks to everybody who put in so much time and effort to make this whole conference uh, happen. I'm gonna go ahead and move directly to share screen if I can. 
and um, see how that works for us. Um, almost there. And then I want to go to, so um, we should be seeing a full screen uh, PowerPoint. And uh, if we're not seeing that, maybe somebody could let me know, but I think you probably have it. Um, the uh, title, as Donna has said, is Information Inquiry and Leadership for Equity. Um, I'm going to zoom through a fair number of slides, um, get, keep, you, uh, keep you alert to this, and um, I'm going to, uh, uh, we're going to finish up with some Q&A at the end. Um, the overview of what we're going to do is I'm going to tell two stories of continuous improvement, both of which relied heavily upon data and the use of data systems. The first story is Chicago Public Schools that was uh, once identified as the worst school system in America. I want you to see what's happened in Chicago in the last 30 years. I also want to talk about the University of Illinois Chicago story, how we use data for continuous improvement, what the results of that have been. I want to talk further about what the implications of these stories are for leading for continuous equity improvement and the importance of data in that, and also specific challenges in leading high quality early childhood ed and challenges in leading early intervention as well. And then finally, to talk a little bit about the, the challenge of aligning research practice and policy in our fields, because those three things are not very much aligned in the work that we do. Um, you will, uh, if the worst nightmare that I always have about these things happens, namely my internet goes down, um, you will be steered to the chat room in which you'll be able to identify a specific problem or obstacle that you face in your role. In other words, if I end up shutting down for a couple of minutes through some accident that we hope does not happen, um, you won't be sitting in confusion, but instead you're gonna do some entering into the chat and then we're gonna use those responses later on in the discussion. We'll conclude uh, this entire session with questions and answers that are gonna be moderated by Donna. I'm gonna start with something that we already know. Something here is obvious and something is not. The obvious thing is that the lowest socioeconomic uh, districts in the country at the lower left uh, are also the lowest performing districts in the country overall. What we see here is a Sean Reardon graph from Stanford's Policy Institute that shows us that um, there's a direct correlation between district uh, family income and district uh, performance of kids in schools. These are 10,000 school districts represented here. The obvious thing is that school districts that are in very poor neighborhoods uh, or poor locations in terms of family poverty don't do very well uh, as compared on the upper right hand side to districts and neighborhoods that have high family incomes. Here's what isn't obvious about this though. Look at those blue arrows. What those blue arrows tell us is that within any given economic point, whether you're middle income, lower income, higher income, there's actually room for two to even four grade level difference in performance in school districts that have the same economic and even the same ethnic profile. In other words, there's a sense in which zip code isn't completely destiny, although it does help us understand the challenges. So for example, based on demographics alone, Charlotte Mecklenburg, North Carolina, which is a very diverse district, should be achieving at much lower levels than students in Simi Valley, California, where the Ronald Reagan Library is located, and where we have um, much less diversity as compared to Charlotte Mecklenburg. And yet what we see is that for some reason, Charlotte Mecklenburg is performing way above where Simi Valley, California is performing, which is six, uh, six tenths of a grade level below uh, national norms. And Charlotte Mecklenburg, which is a much less wealthy district, is performing at uh, four tenths of a grade level above national norms or the equivalent of four months of schooling. Um, the Chicago story uh, is one story of a very poor school district uh, economically that uh, actually was identified by Secretary of Education William Bennett in 1987 as the worst school system in America. Um, I'm checking my time here just to be sure. And um, the, uh, in fact, the, the following day, the press said, did he, did he really mean that? And was, he, was he kidding about that or did he really mean it? And he said, well, look, who's worse? 
tell me somebody who's worse. And, and then people actually took up the challenge and they started thinking, well, maybe Detroit is worse or maybe Cleveland is. The point is that's not a conversation you wanna be in. If your school is a candidate, school system is a candidate for the worst system in America, there are probably some problems that, that need to be addressed. What we find 30 years later is a headline that tells us that in fact, Chicago had become one of the highest gaining school districts in the country, uh, leading the country in academic growth. Uh, Sean Reardon's study out of Stanford, the same study that produced the, uh, uh, the 10,000 district analysis, um, found that Chicago is in the upper 4% in the entire nation in student gains between third and eighth grade. Uh, so people started to pay attention. Well, what, what happened in Chicago then? I want to make sure I get this next. Yeah, so in order to, let me make sure I'm on the right slide. Yes, in order to uh, sort of illustrate that and the use of data in, in sort of getting from here to there, um, here's a slide that I don't want you to get too involved in. I'm only going to give you less than a minute on it. But basically what you see is the top third, middle third, and bottom third of the chart are African-American kids at the top, Latino kids in the middle, and white kids at the bottom. And what this shows is for grade three back in 2001, the year that No Child Left Behind was first passed, back in uh, 2001, grade three kids in Chicago um, in reading and in math, whether they were above or below the free and reduced lunch line, the pink indicates those kids lagged behind the rest of the state of Illinois. For Latino kids, they lag behind the rest of the state of Illinois in certain categories, like uh, males, for example, who are eligible for free and reduced lunch, or for females uh, in math um, and, uh, and males in math, what we see is for those kids eligible for, they were doing more poorly than uh, Latinx kids in the rest of the state. Uh, white kids, uh, we were lagging behind. Uh, less so, but black kids were really, really behind the rest of the state. Latino kids were somewhat behind. And you'll notice um, the tan means, the tan boxes mean that's where Chicago was simply about the same as the rest of the state. So Chicago wasn't leading anywhere. In the next slide, we're going to expand this graph to look at third, fifth, and eighth grade math and reading, boys and girls above and below the free and reduced lunch line. What we see here is we start to see some Chicago edge in grade eight. You'll be interested to know that the reason that we think that we started to see a grade eight edge by 2001 is Chicago doesn't have a middle school system and there's significant evidence that middle schools are academically challenging for uh, most population groups. So what you see here in Chicago is a pre-K through eight system and the eighth graders are starting to actually do almost as well, not quite, but almost as well as the rest of the state. The third and the fifth graders are definitely not doing as well as the rest of the state. This is in 2001. The next slide is 2012, all right? Because this was a period where we really doubled down on school leadership and uses of data in Chicago at the system level and the school level. Uh, we're actually writing up right now the research on that story of the uses of data at the system level and at the school level. And what you'll see in the next slide, look again, where you see pink is where Chicago is behind the rest of the state, where you see green is where Chicago is ahead of the rest of the state. By 2012, we had turned it around. Um, Chicago was now substantially leading the rest of the state of 72 different cells for grades three, five, and eight, boys and girls, math and reading. CPS was ahead in 62 of those cells and behind in none of them. Um, this is particularly significant at the third grade level because as all of you know, um, uh, third grade achievement has a profound impact on fifth and eighth grade achievement. And we were starting to see emphasis on uh, pre-K through three really paying off for Chicago. What you'll notice in this particular slide, for example, is that for low income kids in the city of Chicago across these years, by, let's see if we can see the bottom there, by 2015, what we find is that Latinx kids in that orange line in the middle are actually outperforming white kids in the rest of the state. Chicago didn't just close the achievement gap, it actually reversed it. We're also seeing, because we're paying attention to the data, that not all boats are rising as fast. 
although black kids in Chicago used to be behind the rest of the state, they, uh, black kids in our state, they now actually are ahead of the rest of the state, whether it's below or above the free and reduced lunch line. The reason it's so significant that Hispanic kids are not only outperforming Hispanic kids in the rest of the state above and below the free and reduced lunch, but outperforming white kids as well, is because the largest population group of kids in Chicago schools is now Latinx kids. So what we see there is an enormous sort of step forward um, in about a 15 year period um, for Chicago public schools through a concentrated focus on using data at the system level as well as using data at the, uh, at the school level. Um, one of the things that we see therefore is there's a big payoff in fourth grade NAEP games. The reason I'm showing you NAEP is because it's not just that state testing showed a difference, but our national norm testing showed a dramatic difference as well, where Chicago public school kids um, are uh, dramatically increasing, whereas the rest of the state is staying flat. Again, um, all observers attribute the uh, two of the major variables here uh, as being uses of data and uh, developing school leaders who are able to use such data. So two findings from the Sean Reardon National Study of 10,000 districts. One of the things he noticed was, of course, that test scores improved from third to eighth grade in Chicago much faster than most of the rest of the country. But here's the second one that's so profound. Students in recent cohorts have higher math and reading skills than third graders in earlier cohorts. Something is going on in the pre-K through three period here that's actually driving the change between three and eight. In other words, of these, when you say they got, our kids got six years of growth in five years of schooling, most of that growth came by the end of grade three. Um, so it ca it's causing us to try to do research to understand how do we sustain and accelerate that? And what were the things going on in P through three during this period that were actually driving the entire school system upward? Uh, one of the things that was doing this was a, um, a decision that was made in Chicago public schools after being declared the worst in the U.S. to start, focus on, start focusing on school leaders as the key to change. So in 1996, Chicago won the right from the state legislature to establish its own eligibility requirements for principals. Getting a state license for the principalship in Chicago will not qualify you to be a principal unless you pass the Chicago eligibility assessment, which actually has a failure rate of 60% of people who hold a state eligibility or state certificate. Um, the school is the unit of change was posted all through the downtown offices. And in 2000, they uh, added, and the principal is the leader of that change. In 2001 and 2, we began to see CPS forming aggressive partnerships with UIC, new leaders for new schools, preparing principals able to use data to improve learning outcomes in the schools. The UIC story then is a similar story of um, going from um, not a very strong program to one that is having significant impact on the system. And a central piece of that was principals learning to use data. We have an 18 year continuous improvement journey that's ongoing right now. Um, the first phase was sort of planning what, it need, what we needed to do on the basis of the data that we were able to collect. Our principals were not making any difference in student learning in public schools that was any different from other people's principals. We started to develop a new program design that could prepare database principles to lead instruction. Phase two was a problem driven improvement phase where we kept identifying what are the problems of practice that our principals are facing and how do we help them address those problems. And then by phase three, um, the last several years, we've been imp uh, implementing cycles of inquiry that I'll describe in a moment at not just the level of our program, but at the level of every school that our principals are leading. So our principals are learning to lead cycles of inquiry. Um, the starting points for us in developing um, a, a program that would make a difference in Chicago public schools is we considered our client to be not the graduate student that wants a certificate, but rather the student in the public school that deserves um, a good principal. Um, we established a partnership with Chicago Public Schools and began mon monitoring the progress of that partnership. Um, we taught all of our principals how to continuously improve their work 
And data played a role in the lower right hand corner on this data played a role in every one of these. We had to keep collecting data on whether we were accomplishing what we were trying to accomplish and then improving on the basis of that data. Um, since 2003, um, we've placed 94% of our graduates as principals and assistant principals, 70% of them as principals, as opposed to the state average uh, of 15% of people who graduate from principal programs achieving the principalship. So um, this has led to uh, our continuously trying to improve what we're doing and get better at it. Um, our principals actually improve school performance on CPS indicators better than the rest of the system. We have 110 current leaders, including the CEO of Chicago Public Schools came from our program, network chiefs who supervise principals, uh, the chief of early childhood education who just left actually was our uh, was our graduate language and culture and so forth and so on. So at any given moment, there's a huge footprint of our continuous improvement data-based folks on the system itself. Partly as a result of this, we've received a number of national awards, um, including uh, Judy Woodruff, who you'll see a little bit later, did a nice special on PBS uh, for, uh, about the program. Um, cycles of inquiry, however, reveal new equity challenges. And here's something that we're just pulling out of the research right now. We're just producing this research. And that is that, it, that race and poverty don't really predict the most struggling schools in CPS. In fact, race and po high poverty and high minority schools actually are improving at a fairly dramatic rate unless they are schools that have real problems with mobility and attendance. We had to dig deep on the data on that but the lowest performing schools in Chicago public schools and the state of Illinois are schools that have real problems with mobility and attendance. Um, high churn schools, we call these churn schools, high churn schools in CPS are full one and a half grade levels behind the stable enrollment schools by third grade in math and reading. And yet 15% of these high churn schools are actually performing at a higher level than that. They're actually improving, sustained improvement over a five-year period. And so we're now researching what do the data tell us about how those schools are using uh, their data to try to improve. How do school leaders improve learning outcomes? Um, the, uh, in other words, this is not useful information unless we understand how, how school leaders can and how center leaders, because we've done these studies in early childhood centers as well in partnership with the ounce of prevention. Um, the leadership challenge is to organize a school or a center to support adult and student learning at scale. Adult learning is absolutely central. And in fact, we say adult learning in every school is job one for the principal. Um, this is particularly true because of what you already know about the difficulties of, the, of, of a highly prepared workforce in early childhood education and early intervention. Um, we start with organizing for P3 learning because that's our highest leverage ever. Uh, in, the, in the life of the student. Um, we use cycles of inquiry to address identified problems of practice. What are the problems that are getting in the way of our P3 kids learning better? What are we gonna do about it? And we treat teachers as those who do the diagnosing, not the problem to be diagnosed. That means teachers are engaged collaboratively in identifying problems of practice and in coming up with um, uh, uses of data uh, that will help them understand the origins of those problems of practice. Put into a, a theory of impact chart, it looks like this. If we want our student engagement and learning in P through three on the right hand side uh, to continue to improve, we've got to improve our teaching and instruction. We don't really know how to do this at scale without improving the quality of the classroom experience for each kid. In order to improve teaching and instruction, the organizational capacity of the school has to improve so it is a site of adult learning. So there are systems in place that help teachers learn. And that organizational capacity only happens if we have administrative leadership include, and that's not just one strong leader, but in fact, it means administrative leadership that knows how to work with a team to accomplish these things. A simple three-part formula for all of you, because most of you here are leaders in different levels of your organization. A three-part formula that comes out of Leithwood in 2004 is the idea that what good leaders do is lead vision, they lead systems, because without systems you won't accomplish the vision, 
and they lead people because without people learning how to make the systems work, the vision will never be accomplished. And absolutely, uses of data and learning how to collaboratively assess data are part of the people learning that has to take place if the systems are going to, in fact, help the vision come true. At UIC, our principals learn to use cycles of inquiry. I've used that term a couple of times. Uh, those of you who have backgrounds uh, in the special education community are particularly familiar with this. Um, the idea of implementation of, uh, of plans and then monitoring of those plans to uh, check results. We have a five part cycle that we use, which is a modification of the PDSA uh, model that came out of the 1930s. Um, uh, and that has taken on many, many different forms. The exact model doesn't matter so much, but you'll notice that in all of these steps, data are important. So if we're gonna understand the cause of the problem that we're trying to identify, we've got to look up, we need good data, we need good information to try to select an instructional improvement strategy to, to improve instruction, we need data to understand where are we now with our instruction versus where we need to be. Setting progress and outcome goals makes no sense whatsoever unless we're setting ourselves up to understand what are the data that are gonna tell us whether we're succeeding and so on. You guys get the point. This is a modification of a traditional PDSA cycle, but it, it foregrounds data in ways that the traditional PDSA does not do. Now, this leaves us with some particular challenges in leading early childhood education if it's gonna be high quality. We know from the research that just having early childhood education isn't the key. The key is high quality early child education. And that's interfered with by variability of delivery systems. We have many different delivery systems for early childhood in most areas. Um, we have an often underprepared workforce. Um, our center leaders or principals usually do not have strong early childhood backgrounds. Um, in a sense, we have an underdeveloped profession. Highly developed professions have a very strong alignment between research, practice, and policy. We've got pretty good research on early intervention, pretty good research on leadership, pretty good research on early childhood ed. But the extent to which our practices at scale reflect that research and our policies support how to implement those practices are actually very weak. So our funding at a national, state, and local level is also problematic. And in fact, it's, it's embarrassing that a country that's this highly developed uh, devotes as few resources to early childhood education uh, as we do. Um, leadership on problems of equity practice in early childhood can be developed in practice on, on site. Uh, we have professional standards in early childhood as a proxy for research and best practice. For example, the NACI standards or the Council for Exceptional Children Division of Early Childhood Standards. In other words, we know what it's supposed to look like because the research has supported these standards. But then how do we get to see those standards implemented in practice? And that's where we want to see school leaders and school sites and center sites using these standards for database continuous improvement conversations. How are we doing with our families? What's our evidence? How are we doing with our teaching practices? What's our evidence? Are we using evidence-based assessment? What's our evidence for that? And so on. Professional standards can become a focus uh, of collaborative identification of problems of practice. Another example of this is the, um, something that I want to draw to your attention if you don't already know about it, but this is the National Association of Education uh, of Elementary School Principals leading P through three learning communities. Came out in 2014, but there's a, a brand new edition coming out uh, this year. They have basically six different domains in which they want to see leaderships excel uh, for early childhood programs. Any program can use these six as a kind of a rubric and say, how well are we doing? Let's look at number five. Are we building professional capacity across the learning community? What's our evidence? What's our data that says we are? And if we don't have the data, what do we need to collect? There are challenges in leading early intervention that are similar to uh, just early childhood in general. Um, and in fact, uh, the early intervention challenges encompass the early childhood challenges. Um, and uh, we know that there have been a number of developments in the field in the last 40 years um, in terms of development of authentic assessment, 
curriculum-based assessment, functional content and objectives, these kinds of elements of what strong uh, early intervention programs look like are things that we can hold up as a mirror to ourselves at every level you know, of policy practice um, right down to the center level itself. This requires aligning data systems, aligning research practice and policy. Um, as I say, they're well aligned in a mature field. They're not that well aligned in school leadership at all. They're not that well aligned in early childhood ed and not that well aligned early. And we're bringing all three of those together. We're bringing together three fields that are not what you would call maturely developed fields in terms of their practices and their policies. And we're asking um, to, in fact, do these at a high level. So this place is a significant, um, in a sense, opportunity for leverage at the delivery level. If we can get school leaders, center leaders who can deliver strong uses of data for assessing problems of practice at the local level, we have high leverage as we demonstrated in Chicago. Um, taking the school as the unit of change turns out to be a high leverage activity problem identification and collaborative problem solving, not acting as if the teachers are the problem to be solved. The most valuable current web source for continuous improvement methods is the Carnegie Foundation for Advancement of Teaching web, so, web uh, page. And also Tony Bright's book from 2015 is really right now the most user-friendly resource, how America's schools can get better at getting better. Um, we've uh, used our time up, and so we now have to turn to a, uh, an opportunity for some chat Q&A. Donna is going to monitor, is going to be the uh, moderator of this session. And um, what you are going to do as individuals is take a minute to reflect in the chat room, which is about to open for all of you, on the extent to which your school, your center, or organizational unit currently uses data in cycles of inquiry to focus on specific problems of practice. If you don't like that prompt, you may have a question of your own that you wanna raise, and Donna's gonna moderate the question and answer period. So in a sense, start with your own question if you have one. If you don't, make a comment if you would on the extent to which you see cycles of inquiry used for purposes of continuously improving service delivery in the environment in which you sit. So that said, Donna, I'm gonna turn it over to you to moderate this and let you also monitor the time so that you can tell us yeah. when the time is over. Okay. Okay, hi, Steve, I'm back. Can you hear me, Steve? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. Well, you gave us a lot to think about, about leadership and data. We probably need another hour for discussion. Um, we might have to collect all these questions and bring you back another time too. Um, I'll look for some questions in the chat, um, but while I'm waiting for some questions, um, I, wanted the, I, I was very impressed with the idea of the cycles of inquiry, and we're talking about that, and the five-step process of looking at data. And could you say, so we're going to be having some sessions on that. Can you say like a few things what you've learned about how to bring together administrators, providers, teachers, parents to review data? Like what have, what have we learned about how to do that well? Uh, yeah, I'll say one of the things that we've learned, uh, and that is that people are not always eager to look at the data. Um, and in other words, there's some social emotional difficulties here that have to be taken seriously because sometimes people feel that if we're looking at data, especially data that shows differences in student learning outcomes, that we're pointing fingers at somebody. So I, I want to just double check. Can you hear me okay, Donna? Yeah, yeah. I have a really good follow up to that. Well, wow, somebody's asking that their strategic planning and their state agency, early childhood special ed staff, they have formalized a process with root cause and problem identification, and they're in the process of selecting instructional improvement strategies. So they're doing exactly what you're saying, mm -hmm. but it's taking longer than they think <laughs> the first couple of steps. So how long does this thing take usually? That's a great question because, and here's where leadership matters also, uh, um, because if we're not careful, this thing can stretch itself out month after month. 
And so what you want to do is establish fairly tight routines of collaboration. Um, Carnegie Foundation, for example, publishes a 90 day guide. And it says that you can go through problem identification, researching the sources of the problem and establishing a plan in 90 days. There's nothing magical about that because you can actually do that in 30 days. Mm -hmm. uh, but the truth is bringing people together with honest collaboration and honest conversation actually does take some time. And good leadership makes it take less time. So my encouragement on that front is to say, be aware and be intentional about making it take as little time as possible by getting clear on what the routines of collaboration are going to be un un until plan implementation begins. Mm -hmm. um, so another question is um, looking at longer term data and looking at have you seen positive effects on attracting, preparing and retaining leaders for this work? And if not, like, what are some of the problems with that? So I'm going to give good news and bad news. The good news is we are pulling in more principals, more qualified teacher leaders who are seeking to be uh, principals than ever before. Mm -hmm. So there, it's exciting because people are, and one of the most inspiring things for a teacher leader is to see a principal having a significant impact, and I'm gonna, I keep talking schools, but this also applies to community-based centers. When we see a school leader or center leader really changing the game, changing the outcomes, it's inspiring for teacher leaders to want to do that also. Um, now here's the, here's the not so good news. We're not seeing a strong pipeline of early childhood educators moving into the school leader and principal uh, role. And um, where we see it, we see it from centers. We're not seeing it very much in schools, although we see it to some extent. So for example, one of our people who became the head of early childhood for Chicago Public Schools had an early childhood background, went through our principalship program, became a phenomenal principal. But he's really the exception rather than the rule. So we need to keep, uh, I think, cultivating the early childhood garden so that we can get more early childhood people into leadership roles. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the time and I'm seeing that we're really run over and I really want to get to, uh, to hear from Judy. And so we thank you, Steve. We may uh, invite you back for more um, Q&A. And uh, we want to thank you. Go to our next slide. Thank you for. And, and if we've been in person, you might have gotten a standing ovation. Now maybe next time we'll be in person. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, Donna. I'm gonna stay and watch Judy also. Okay, okay, let's go to, um, so next, our final, our last keynote speaker, it's about, I uh, hope you all can stay, uh, it is about 13 minutes. So I'm pleased and honored to introduce our next keynote speaker, Judy Woodruff, broadcast journalist. She's the anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour and she's covered politics and other news for more than four decades at NBC, CNN, and PBS. At NBC News, she was White House correspondent from 1977 to 82. Then she went to PBS, and from 83 to 93, she was the chief Washington correspondent for the McNeil Lair News Hour. Then 84 to 90, she anchored the PBS documentary series Frontline with Judy Woodruff. She moved to CNN in 1993 and she was anchor there and senior correspondent for 12 years. And among her duties, she anchored a weekday program inside politics. In 2007, she came back to PBS NewsHour and in 2013, she and Gwen Ifill were named the first two women to co-anchor a national news broadcast. After Eiffel's death, then Judy became the sole anchor. Judy also is the founding co-chair of the International Women's Media Foundation. And this is an organization dedicated to promoting and encouraging women in journalism worldwide. Judy's won numerous um, awards in journalism, including the Pointner Medal of Lifetime Achievement in Journalism, the Gwen Eiffel Freedom Press Award for the Committee to Protect Journalists, 
and the Cronkite Award for Excellent in, Excellence in Journalism. She also has more than 25 honorary degrees. Anyway, as you can imagine, Judy's been extremely busy during this ongoing election season. So we were thrilled when she graciously took the time to record her talk with us. And you're gonna see from her comments that she really values the importance of your leadership. She will talk with us about a mother's view, my experience raising a son with special education needs. And here we go. Hello, and thank you so much, Donna, for inviting me to speak at your conference. It is such an honor. I am Judy Woodruff, and my day job is being the anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour, of course, the nightly news broadcast on PBS. And as you probably noticed, there's not much going on in the news these days, so it was easy for me to get away to think about these remarks. Seriously, this is just about the craziest, busiest news cycle I've ever experienced in my decades of covering news and especially American politics. So that's why I'm gonna be keeping my remarks brief or as brief as I can. First, I just wanna say congratulations to Donna Spiker and to Kathy Hebler, your co-directors for the work that they have done, pulling all of this together. Planning a conference is difficult under normal circumstances. Uh, so doing it in a pandemic uh, where everyone is remote, virtual, uh, is a whole lot harder, as we have learned in trying to build our news program every night. I so appreciate the work that all of you are dedicated to doing and that is making it possible, I know, for children with special learning needs to get the education they deserve and to help their teachers, to help their parents uh, as they work to make that happen by understanding best practices and everything else that goes along with a successful learning experience so that these ch children realize their full and eventually lifelong potential. That's what it's all about. No one appreciates that more than the parent of a child with special needs. The reason you invited me to speak is because I am the mother of three, including our older son, Jeffrey, who was born with spina bifida. Fortunately, a mild case, but with complications, including hydrocephalus, that we had to attend to, and which it turned out created learning challenges that we and his school were not prepared for. I, I just want to say, Jeffrey, just to give you a little bit of a picture, Jeffrey walked early. Um, he was a bright toddler. He was an early talker with a great vocabulary and lots of curiosity. He blossomed in pre-kindergarten and even before that. He loves school. I guess I'm sounding like every parent talking about their child. But in kindergarten, his teachers did tell us that they were a little worried that he was slower to learn to read than some of the other students or to learn the way they were teaching it. We were so very fortunate. We were sending him to a wonderful private school with wonderful teachers. But this was the mid 1980s and they were not a school. This was not a school accustomed then to working with children with different learning styles. Jeffrey forged ahead. He soon got, I think it's fair to say, back on track. Um, we pretty much took it for granted that he was gonna be fine academically. Our worries actually shifted as he grew older to his social development because spina bifida left him bladder and bowel incontinent. He had to catheterize himself. Um, since he was, I mean, starting at the age of five years old. And he struggled with fitting in, uh, quite honestly, because he was a little different. By third grade, we knew there were challenges. Um, I knew that from reading the literature from the spina bifida community. Um, challenges that might pop up around math concepts, in particular, we were warned math, math concepts and abstract reasoning. And these were starting to surface, as I say, at about third grade. I remember frequent com conferences with his teachers to strategize, actually to plead with them, to be willing to work with Jeffrey and his different style of learning. It might take him longer, but he would do it. We had seen it before, but of course, with every grade, with every semester, um, with every month, there were new things to learn. This was the beginning of a long stream of 
steady stream of teacher parent meetings from elementary school through middle school and on to high school to make sure that Jeffrey's learning needs were met. I remember writing out in detail, this is starting in third grade, what Jeffrey needed exactly in order to succeed at math, at writing, and so on. Every year, uh, a new set of teachers, long sessions trying to explain to them, and as I listened to them, um, this child that they would be working with. They're looking at my husband and me as the parents who mean well, and we want the best for our child, but who know little or nothing about what they face as teachers. And I don't underestimate the difficulty of that. Um, even in a relatively small classroom, and we're talking 15, maybe 20 children. To make a long story short, Jeffrey overcame obstacles. He didn't shine in every subject or under every teacher, but he became a voracious reader. He became a lover of science. He was very interested in what had happened to him, his own spina bifida. Um, he insisted on an internship at the CDC in Atlanta. We live in Washington, DC, where he was just finishing. This is when he was just finishing eighth grade and we managed to work it out. We'd go down there for a couple of weeks, stay with friends because he was fascinated in learning more about diseases, infectious diseases, and so on. Then the summer after ninth grade, <laughs> he had an internship that he arranged all by himself at the NIH. He loved science. Again, you know, he worked in a cancer research lab for a couple of months. And he was just starting an internship at the Food and Drug Administration. Again, one of the advantages of living in Washington uh, in the summer after 10th grade when everything changed. His neurosurgeon recommended a surgical procedure to replace the shunt that Jeff had had implanted since he was an infant. It's there to, to drain excess cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and then by the time Jeffrey was 16 years old or 1998, he had had it for virtually his entire life. These procedures were being done all the time. We didn't think that much of it. We didn't we didn't love the fact that he had to have it, but we recognized if the doctor was recommending it, it was important. But something went wrong. Uh, the replacement shunt they put in failed. Jeff had to go back to the hospital. Um, the surgeon recommended a different procedure, and tragically, Jeff emerged from that procedure with profound disabilities. He went from being a teenage boy who couldn't run fast, but who skied, who swam, who rode bikes, participated in all activities of life, to being in the hospital for five months, in a coma for three months, the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, part of the Kennedy Krieger uh, neuro uh, rehab facility there, having to learn to talk and eat again, losing vision permanently in one eye, having a speech impairment permanently, losing the use of an arm, and not being able to walk except for exercise with a walker. 22 years later, Jeff is today 38 years old. Jeff is still in a wheelchair. He requires help with many activities of daily living, including all transfers to and from his wheelchair. After missing a year of school, um, during which this was back in 1998-99, during which he had terrific help from some of his former teachers who showed up at our house, literally got him back on his feet again by individual tutoring, working with, they created notebooks. I, I will be, I'm eternally grateful uh, to these teachers who had taught Jeffrey when he was ele in elementary school and we had stayed in touch with them. They literally got him back on his feet and, this, and I have to thank the special education school at the Kennedy Krieger Institute uh, in Baltimore. Jeff returned to high school uh, a year after this with a full-time companion. Um, who accompanied him, who worked with his teachers. We had a succession of young men and women who were aiming for medical school, who each of them worked with Jeff for a year, would come and go to school with him, work with him on homework assignments, whatever he needed. Took a huge amount of work, a huge amount of accommodation on the school's part, on the teacher's part, and of course, on Jeffrey's part. Uh, he lost, the thing I should have mentioned which was made all this much more complicated was he lost his short-term memory so that when he would learn something new, he would have to go over it and over it and over it and over it in order to retain it. He still managed to do it, but you can imagine what that was like. Um, so everybody was working really hard 
uh, with, um, with limited uh, experience with anybody, anything like this. And then uh, after, after uh, uh, all this work in high school, Jeffrey managed to uh, graduate. Uh, we celebrated that. And of course, Jeffrey immediately said, I want to go to college. There was a community college near here in Montgomery County. He went there for four years, took two courses a semester, huge amount of work on their end and on our end with the special education and learning support staff there. Then after four years there, but not nearly enough credits to graduate, Jeffrey saw his younger brother applying to college out of state. And he, Jeff said, I want to go away to college. So we found a needle in a haystack. Uh, we identified two colleges uh, east of the Mississippi River. One of them turned out to be what appeared to be a perfect fit in North Carolina. Um, it offered housing and education for students with significant physical disabilities, but with the capacity to do college work. Um, this was the school Jeffrey attended was St. Andrews uh, Presbyterian College in uh, uh, Laurenburg, North Carolina. He spent four and a half years uh, at St. Andrews with special dormitory, special housing accommodations. The school actually moved to phase out that program to end it uh, within a, a year or so after Jeff uh, began going there, but we, we and he um, forged ahead and made it happen regardless. We got caregivers and caretakers um, to provide the support that he needed. Um, but he was determined to graduate and he did. They allowed him to create a liberal arts degree that combined three things that he was really interested in, English, physical therapy, uh, and religion. He loved science, but the memorization in science, um, the abstract concepts were really difficult for him. And the lab work, of course, was impossible for him. But what a great combination um, for a young man like Jeffrey. I'm just going to conclude these remarks, and I wish that we had a chance to interact, but, um, but because of these virtual formats, I'm doing it the way that I am. I just want to conclude by saying that I know what would have helped us along the way at every step would have been to have more information when Jeffrey was young, when he was in preschool, in kindergarten, in first grade, what to do with a student with special education needs, special learning needs. I so often felt like I was the only parent in the world in, and I was searching in pitch dark with a blindfold on for information, for guidance that no one else had any experience with. Or if they had, they hadn't written it down, they hadn't preserved it they hadn't made it available to other parents. Um, and I'm sure there were people out there who had had a similar experience to ours, um, but I hardly knew where to go. The Spina Bifida Association was as helpful as they could be, but of course, for every individual, it's different. It's hard enough to figure out the right education path for any child with special learning needs, um, but to do it without the support, without the, the back, uh, the kind of background work and research, the data collection that you all do, um, it, it, would, it, it was and has been profoundly more difficult. So that's why I just want to say what you are doing to try to get this information into a form that's accurate, that's easily accessible to others, that is shareable, is so critical. Um, I, I salute what you are doing. I encourage you to keep at it, which I know you will. And I thank you for the difference you are making in the lives of so many children, so many parents, moms and dads, and so many teachers and educators across this country and for decades to come. So thank you again. Keep up this great work. And it's such an honor to be with you. So thanks to Judy for that wonderful keynote talk. Pretty sure she would have gotten a standing ovation too. That was a wonderful story. And I want to just say that it reminds us that our work is about people and that we're the beginning of the start of what are lifelong journeys for children and families. And I think that was a really important message for us. So I got two more quick things. Um, we know we ran over time here. We'll see you later today in the roll alike sessions this afternoon, then tomorrow and Wednesday. We have two blocks of the six concurrence sessions. 
And um, th some of those sessions will have breakout rooms for discussion and the TA providers may be in your session. They're there to listen. And the Zooms will be muted except when we're having questions and interacting. And all our sessions are being recorded and they'll be all posted um, on the website after the meeting. And um, we're not recording the breakout sessions. And our final slide is uh, usually at this point we have housekeeping where we have to give you information about where the restrooms are, where you can find restaurants to get food. But I know where all of you are and I know that you're going to be able to find the nearby rooms in your house so you can take care of all your needs. <laughs> I knew you would have laughed at my joke, so I put in a laugh track. So we'll see you all later this afternoon. Goodbye, everyone.